blessing. Uh, we're glad you're here. What a wonderful day. Anybody else got a blessing? You, you, you are related. We can see just by looking at you guys. <laughs> we're, we're, <laughs> well, we're glad you're here. Anybody else got a blessing? Yes. Amen. Amen. It's Easter. I talked to my siblings yesterday on the phone, and one hasn't gone to church since his wife died two years ago. Another one hasn't gone to church since she moved down south because she didn't know what churches were going to be like down south. That's a surprise. And I said, guys, just go to church on Easter. Everybody goes to church on Easter. They won't. It'll be just fine. And they're like, oh, I never thought of it that way. But it gets them in the door. Amen. All right. Anybody else got a blessing? Nobody else is blessed? Oh, come on. You, got, you woke up early? Oh, breathing. I'm good. Oh, my goodness. You can't say that in my house. My grandson would say, well, they're all from Boston area. Oh, yeah. Boston's the last place, so. No, Grammy, no Ankies. No Ankies, Grammy. No Ankies. Anybody else got a blessing? Oh. I do. Yes. You made it here today. That's a blessing. With the help of the minister, they able to bring us. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. You don't know how much it means to somebody, some little thing that you do. You know? That's true. Well, I had um, two of my daughters and their families over for dinner last Sunday. So there were 12 of us for dinner. And then her, the youngest one, and her three kids all stayed and went home Wednesday. And by yesterday, the two-year-old is on the phone going, Hey, Gammy, can I come over for dinner and stay another week? So, you know, I was blessed to think that they had a good time and that I got a couple of days sleep after they went home. Because <laughs> the first day, my, the four-year-old woke up and she looks at, comes over and looks at me and she goes, it's time for you to get up. I'm like, I was staying in bed until five or six for you guys. I'm going to just get up normal time then. So, anyways, well, you're going to have more opportunity to share your blessings. So let's sing. In the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he arose, with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to
From the grave he arose with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. He arose the victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever for his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Somebody else got a blessing. Uh, amen. That's, you know, uh, when you think about how the, and it was interesting because this week, I can't remember when uh, Easter, Passover, and Ramadan all fell in the same, same time frame. It, it's been a tremendous blessing because for our Muslim brothers and sisters, I'm always so impressed with my girlfriends that are observing Ramadan for the, pe for the uh, prayer for the intense month of prayer. And, and the times that we, f that we do that as Christians, don't you see God answering prayers like he hasn't answered in a long time? And uh, I used to attend Torah studies with my, my, one of my best friends that went to the temple. And, um, and so I understand and have attended quite a few Passover, um, Messianic Passover services. And the fact that it, all falls on the same time was just such a blessing, you know, to celebrate the blood on the lampposts that covered the, the Jews so that they weren't killed, and the blood on the cross that opened the door for us for eternal life. Amen? What Jesus did was a wonderful thing. And you know what that also includes? Any of you had somebody do something to you that it's hard to forgive them for? Yeah? No? Okay, so when Jesus died on that cross and said, it's finished, guess what? It's finished. It's done. It's finished. Okay, I'm not going to remember. I'm not going to hold you up for that thing you did to me anymore. To me, that's revolutionary. Because not only did it do that for us, but we have an opportunity to do that for somebody else. And maybe it might open a door for us to share why we can do that for them. Amen? When I survey the wondrous cross On which the Prince of Glory died My riches gave
the place I've come to know. Though my heart and flesh may fail, there's an anchor for my soul. I can say it is well. Jesus has overcome. Thank you, Lord. And the grace. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you because of you, we will rise with you in eternity. Thank you for a day to rejoice and exalt who you are and appreciate the, the door that you open for all of mankind. Everybody had a way, but you were the true way. And you were the only way for eternity. And we just lift up this service to you and we ask that you would bless it, that you would meet every need, that you heal and encourage and cause love to flow in your people. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Good morning, everyone. Every week as we gather together, we light this candle. We call it the military candle because it is for a specific purpose. This is to remind us to pray for our soldiers, our military spouses, and for those who are in the service of our country and also for our missionaries, because they're in the service of the Lord in a similar situation. But it is something that I think we do so often that it may become a little bit of a routine unless we stop and think about it. We need to remember that this is to remind us to pray for them, but also to, I hope that you're not just praying for them this once a week, that you're praying for them every day. Because they're, doing, they're out there 
taking our place as far as that goes in the front lines, wherever they may be. Now, it may be overseas where they're actually in a a very uh, tense situation. It might be here in the country, wherever they're doing whatever their job requires. But once you join the military, you basically sign over your life to the government for a period of time. And that can mean almost anything. I have a friend who is a, <laughs> he's in the army. He's uh, just uh, recently been accepted into special forces training. And um, he's very happy about that. But he's not happy about the fact they're saying, well, we think you're going in August, but it might be May. (laughs) And he's scheduled to get married in May. (laughs) So um, that's part of the military life too, isn't it? You're never really sure. Of course, you can get a call that says be ready in 24 hours or less. That's part of the military. Oh, it can be. And the other half of it, of course, is for the family of that soldier. Because, of course, they're in the same situation. They never know quite what's going to come next. And, of course, while a soldier is overseas or anywhere else that's a combat or possibly dangerous situation, there's always all that extra worry and that extra concern. There's a lot, they go through a lot for us. And I don't think that most civilians really take time to think about that normally. But I think all of us, (laughs) we know enough, uh, either many of us have been in the service and the rest of us know those who have been. So we do probably think about it more than uh, the general public. But even with us, I think we need to pray about these things more than we do. And so let's take a moment as I light this candle. Hey, it started on the first time. And let's pray. Father, as I come to you today, I'm thinking about our soldiers, our servicemen and women, wherever they may be. You know them. You know each one personally. You know what they're going through. You know the stresses and strains of not just that part of their life, but of life in general. And you know about their concern for their families, their concerns for their own safety, and all of these things. Father, I'm glad you do. I'm glad you care enough about them that you do care about all of those things. But I ask you to be with those folks. I ask you to watch over them and keep them because they're out there doing a job that otherwise we wouldn't be safe. We couldn't call ourselves a safe and secure nation otherwise. And Lord, our safety here, we just kind of take for granted. And it's, uh, it's not something that comes free and easy. I ask you, Lord God, to be with those folks. I ask you to be with our missionaries, wherever they are scattered around the world. A lot of them are in situations where Christianity is not really liked. And where they are also in danger. So I ask you to be with them. And they've left their homes and their families to be there. So I ask you, God, to help and strengthen them as well. And I pray, Lord, the God, that as a church, as Christians, we will be more aware and thinking about these things and bringing them before you more often. In Christ's name, amen. Um, thinking about what Mary was asking about blessings, I just wanted to share that uh, I am so grateful that God spoke to my heart and brought me to my family here. And I also want to thank him so much for saving me with his son's death. And tomorrow is a blessing that God gave me 46 years ago. Happy anniversary, honey. The announcements today are, we have a prayer meeting and Bible study on Wednesday night. Um, 
we start at 645 taking prayer request and then we go into our meeting next sunday is 9 30 is the adult sunday school 10 30 is the message god's incredible timing from esther 5 13 to 6 10. there will be a potluck after the morning service our website is up and running um, so you can catch us on calciumcommunitychurch.org. Uh, please feel free to um, look at our book borrowing and movie borrowing center. Uh, there's a lot of good things there, and you might find something you enjoy. Uh, we also have a blessing table in the kitchen that uh, people no longer want or need for various reasons but you might find as a blessing. So please feel free to look at that. And I want to welcome all the visitors today. I am so glad God has brought you here. Good, my, good morning. My name is Roger. Now I'm going to relate back to something that the pastor said. Remember that hurry up and wait in the army? Yes, it's hurry up and wait, but I refuse to allow the Army to waste my time. The one thing they would authorize in your pocket of your, of your uh, uh, fatigues was a Bible. They had a small one that would fit right in there. So whatever they said, smoke them and joke them or whatever, I would whip that thing out. Or if I was out in the field somewhere where I was sitting there for a long time, I had other books that I took with me to study. I got a real cool Christian education in the United States Army. But it's all because of that hurry up and wait. I, would, I refuse to allow them to waste my time. So just a little bit. Now, my job up here is to ask for some, some money from the offering. Now, we used to have our offering plates in the back. We also used to take and go aisle to aisle. We no longer do that. So if God calls you to give, I have offering plates up here. You can put anything you want, whatever God calls you. But don't put your uh, mortgage or anything like that in there. We don't want that. We want what God calls you to give. Okay? Now, I got a little thing I want that God led. Uh, if I get this to cooperate. Okay. Led me to, to talk about today. Because, you know, what, what is this day all about? You know, I'm going to start with Hebrews 1. And then I'm going to share a few other scriptures, and then I'm going to leave it at that. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets in many times, in, very, in many various ways. But in those last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory. The exact representation of the being sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty of heaven. Now, this is what happened to Christ when he went up there, or what God's design was. Then follow. Now, when it said that he had taken uh, purific purified sins, Romans 6.23 for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Think about that. That's a gift. That's an incredible gift. 2 Corinthians 1.18 Christ crucified is, the power, is God's power and wisdom. Wait a minute. Part of it's missing. Uh-oh. <laughs> for the message of the cross is foolishness for those who are perishing. But for those of us being saved, this is the power of God. I know it's the power in my life. All that has, it has from the beginning pointed to this time when man would be reconciled to God. What's it all about? God's attempting to reconcile us to what we were in the garden. That's what it's all about. And with that, let my, this last minute, oh, come on. Cooperate. Sorry. Okay. The one who holds the universe took on human flesh and lived life that we, that we could not live. He died for sinners, 
ascending on high and sat, on, sat down, having finished the work that he came to do. As fully man, he was able to identify with man and women in our sin. As fully God, he was able to take the full divinity, divine payment to sin. His humanity and deity made him uniquely able to save us from our sins. With that, our, let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this, this moment in time, this place, this place, this time, these people. I ask you to bless them, Lord, as only you can. I pray that you, they leave us from here in peace and that you would be with them as they go. And as our Lord taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Ah, good morning again. Today we're going to be actually in two different scriptures, but uh, as you see there, that's what means up there, yep, I'm going to start in Luke 24. And this, of course, is Easter Sunday. We're celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And as we do, I'm sure there's a lot of thoughts and things that go through your mind but we had an interesting question in our morning or in our adult Sunday school class a few minutes ago, and that was, what is the connection between Easter and resurrection? Where does Easter, resurrection, Passover, all of that fit together? Well, some of it is I'm sure you already know that where the Passover part comes in because of course it was. The Passover is where Christ took the um, celebration that the Jewish people had been doing for thousands of years, and as God had commanded them to, and told his disciples that from now on, it was to be done a little differently and for a different reason. And that leads to the communion service that we normally celebrate once a month, or yeah, once a month. We... And that was that he said that from now on, you would instead of celebrating how Christ or how God delivered the Jewish people from Egypt out of slavery, that they should celebrate what was going to be done the next day on the cross as he died on the cross and then spent three days in the grave and rose again the third day. And that's where our communion service comes from is out of the Passover situation. Um, but Easter, well, in every culture for centuries, long before the time of Christ, there was some kind of a spring festival. Um, the one in, that the Romans celebrated was called Easter. Uh, that, and I don't remember their term, but it would translate to Easter. <laughs> uh, when the Christians began celebrating the resurrection of Christ, the Passover and those spring festivals and the celebration of the resurrection were all falling at about the same time. And so eventually all were lumped together on the term of Easter. And I asked my class, so they don't get to answer this, any of you know, is the word Easter ever found in the Bible? I'm seeing a lot of people say no. Unfortunately, you're wrong. <laughs> yep. It is found once. But I have to qualify that with the fact that it, it's when, um, two, two years after the resurrection, when Peter was, in, was imprisoned for preaching about Christ, and they were going to take him out after the Passover to execute him. The Bible, the King James Version says, and they were going to bring him forth after Easter. But if you look at the Greek, 
the original word is the Passover. <laughs> they, uh, be, King James translators, because all of those were all lumped together under the term Easter, just use that term because that's what their people were familiar with. So technically, no. Yeah, it is, but it's not um, the original word. Passover was the Jewish celebration that took place at the same time and led up to what Christ said we should celebrate as the resurrection. Um, so now I, I was impressed with, I, as Mary when she mentioned um, this is one of those years when all three of those spring holidays come right together. And as my wife mentioned, it happens to come on our anniversary. <laughs> so that works out pretty nice too. But as a matter of fact, we were married on Easter Sunday, um, 46 years ago. Uh, it was a beautiful day. You, you look at it out there. We got a little snow this morning. Uh, you never know what you're going to get in a New York spring. We were married here in Watertown. It was an outdoor wedding, 70 degrees. Beautiful Easter Sunday. Had it after church on an Easter Sunday. And, but I got to tell you, we drove down, headed south for our honeymoon. We were going down into the New Jer uh, area in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. We stopped um, just outside Scranton, Pennsylvania, at a little motel for that first night. When I come out in the morning, there was about three inches of snow on the car. <laughs> North Country Spring. <laughs> you never know what to expect. I assume this snow will all be gone, at least by tomorrow. But it just has to remind us we're still in the spring. It ain't summer yet. <laughs> But we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. And the date that is picked for it, of course, is based off the Passover. I think you know how that works. But that's simply because Christ was arrested on the night before the, uh, two nights before the Passover, was crucified on the Passover, or on the day before the Passover, was in the grave, and then arose on the Sunday. So, that's why we tie Easter in with the Passover. My message today is going to be, obviously, about the resurrection. But it's not going to be so much about the details of what happened. I think you guys mostly know about that. I want to add, I'm going to look at that, but we're going to add something else in too. Before we do any of that, there's a couple things I normally do. I normally ask you folks to look around and see who's missing. Are any of our people missing today? We've got a pretty good group. Um, Walter and Francis are not here, and I don't know why, so I'm going to call them. Um, they've, been, Of course, they're <laughs> super regular, and I talked to them, I think it was Wednesday, and things were going well. So um, this is Easter. They have a big family. Wouldn't surprise me, maybe they got family in, but I'm not sure. So I'm going to find out. What about anybody else? Is that it? I think it is. Oh, Bob Grant, of course, we know where he is. I'm sorry. Bob is still in the hospital. He is still... I got to admit, I don't... Uh, I would not appreciate being in his situation. He went in because he has seizures. And they decided to find out what's going on. They're going to induce a seizure or several. So they get a better idea of what's going on. I got to admit, when I think about that, I don't think I would like to be in that situation. <laughs> but my understanding is that though they have managed to seizures, they didn't get the information they wanted yet, so they're still working on it. Um, in the meantime, they discovered that he does have a heart issue and um, that he has uh, liquid buildup in his legs, fluid buildup which would be edema from the heart issue, presumably. So they're working on some extra things, too. So yeah, Bob definitely needs our prayers. Anything, anyone else missing? We're good. Oh, Roger? Chrishella. She is not a regular, but I think she would like to be, and um, was scheduled, was planning to come today, and said that she'd had a very rough night and didn't make it today. Richard and Debbie Manning, I talked to yes, um, yesterday or the day before. 
it seems, and I, some of you, most of you probably know, they have been living in a motel for, <laughs> I don't know, ages, because they're uh, being put up, um, put in the motel by uh, DSS or whoever it is, one of the agencies, and they have been searching for an apartment. And as of Friday, I guess when I talked to them, I think it was Friday. Um, they had looked at an apartment, but had not gotten it. And then Roger informs me this morning that now they've found one and are planning to move immediately. Uh, they didn't find the TSS found it for. Oh, okay. And it's going from hotel to hotel. Okay. Um, that move is going to happen tomorrow. Okay. Um, living out of a motel room would not be wonderful. Not for any length of time. I've done it for weeks at a time, and that was enough well, when I was on the road. Well, hopefully the, the new motel they're going to is a lot better than the one they were at. That was going to be my next comment, because I know the one they were at was not a good situation. Yeah. All right, so we can pray for them and for their move. Anyone else? Are we doing, the rest of us doing pretty good? My wife beat me to it. I was going to say when Mary mentioned blessings, I was going to mention our anniversary, but she beat me to it. <laughs> she got the first chance. All right. Um, if we're good on everybody's situation, let's take time to pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that we do have a moment to be here today, that you've brought us together to worship together, to sing your praises, and to look into your word and just think about what an incredible God you are. I thank you so much for what we're celebrating, for the resurrection of Christ. I know some people get so upset or uptight about the connotations of the word Easter, they don't even want to use it, so they just call it Resurrection Day. I'm not worried about the name. I'm grateful that I can celebrate the fact that Christ rose again from the grave to show the whole world that he truly was the Almighty God in human form, and that he had died on the cross for the very simple purpose of providing a way of salvation for anyone who would ask. Lord, as we come to you, we are grateful for your love that brought all of this, about that, all of it about, the incredible demonstration of your love for us. We're grateful for so many other things, God. Obviously, you've given us a beautiful day. You've given us all the health to be here. Uh, as, as Dan mentioned, he woke up breathing. That's a good thing. I like that, that we should always remember to tell you thank you for this new day and that you've given us another day to live for you. But Lord, as we come together right now, I just ask especially for you to bless our time together for your Holy Spirit to work in the hearts of each one of us, to guide me as I bring forth your word, give me the right words to speak. And I ask you, Lord God, to help each one of us to be drawn closer to you during this time that we're here, that it'll be a time of growing in you. And I ask you, Lord God, to bless them as they go from here. Give them safety, each of us, me too. Safety as we travel and whatever else needs to be done during this day. And I thank you. I thank you for your presence with us, moment by moment, day by day. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, we're going to start in Luke 24. Uh, this is a very familiar passage. One of each of, the, each of the Gospels talks about the resurrection of Christ. So it's easy to pick any one of them and to read that as a reminder of what happened. I like Luke simply because... He includes a couple things that others don't. Starting in verse 1 of Luke 24. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. They being Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and a couple of other women. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered in, and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. 
And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. And they returned from the sepulcher and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. And verse 10 tells us it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. I should probably read that next verse too, because I'm sure you're familiar with that situation. And their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. Hmm. Would it seem strange, would it seem uh, unbelievable to you to be told that someone had risen from the dead? If it wasn't that we know about the resurrection of Christ, it would. Then arose Peter, and he ran unto the sepulchre, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves, and he departed, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. I like that. Peter listens to them. Doesn't say that he was any more believing than the rest of the disciples, but he wanted to check it out. So he runs to the tomb to look for himself. Now John tells us that he wasn't the only one, that Mark also, or excuse me, John also did. That, and it's, I like what it says. Let's turn there. Let's take the moment. John chapter 20. John chapter 20. And I'm going to start with verse 3. This is where John is recording what Peter did. And Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher. That other disciple is John himself. So they ran both together. And the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he, John, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulcher, and seeth the linen clothes lie in the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, John, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Interesting that it says that they saw and believed, but they didn't yet know the scriptures that he had to rise from the dead. Had Jesus told them that he was going to do this? Yeah, five times. <laughs> and during the last year of his ministry, he told them, about the fact that he was going to be arrested, crucified, buried, and rise again. It went over their heads. <laughs> um, sometimes I wonder if we're that um, oblivious when we read the scriptures. I hope not. And yet I suspect that we are to some extent because, don't you know, you can read the same passage a dozen times, and each time you pick up something new out of it. The Holy Spirit shows you something that you, either you forgot or you didn't even notice before. God is so good at that. And if anybody ever tells you that they know this whole Bible inside out, don't believe them. <laughs> because God keeps bringing new things to light every time you read it. That's one of the promises of Scripture, that the Holy Spirit will bring things to your remembrance. I like that word. But the idea that he will bring things to your remembrance means you already have to have either read it or heard it. You've got to know about it first for him to remind you. That's always a good thought. There's so much that talks about our need to know what the scriptures say. And that's a commandment the Lord gives to every Christian to study his word. Study to be approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So those, between those two passages, we get a pretty good understanding of what actually took place on that morning. Though 
Uh, the other two passages each give you a lot, uh, more details, a uh, little different details. It's lovely the way God uses the four Gospels to each one bring out certain little things. But And most people are very familiar with what we mean when we talk about the resurrection. But there's a lot of question in various people's minds about whether or not they believe it, whether or not it really happened. I read an interesting article several years ago that I loved. I read an article by a professional historian. He was, I don't know if he was a Christian or not. And the article certainly didn't give any indication one way or the other. But one of the things he was talking about was about the accuracy of the scriptures. But one little paragraph, one little phrase caught my attention. And that was simply that from a historian's perspective, we have more historical evidence for the resurrection of Christ than we have for Julius Caesar's existence. Everybody knows about Julius Caesar uh, if they know anything much about history. And yet, there's more evidence for the resurrection than there is for his existence. That's incredible. I don't know what the historical evidence is for the existence of Julius Caesar. I've never looked into that. I know there are some Roman records that mention Caesar. So I'm sure there's some, uh, there's probably plenty. But he says the resurrection of Christ is better documented in both the scriptures and his, his, the historical writings of the time than that was. I like that. That's an amazing thing to think about. Because I've never heard anybody talk about it from a historian's perspective. I know it's true. I know I believe what the Bible tells me. And there's plenty of other things to make me very sure of it. But then I have to come to the thought, okay, why did Christ rise from the dead? Our salvation isn't provided by his resurrection, it's provided by what he did on the cross when he died for our sins. So what was the need for the resurrection? Anybody? Why do you think there was a need for the resurrection? New life. Okay, new life. Um, that's a good point. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to spend a little time there this morning. And I have to tell you that this wasn't part of my original plan for this morning. But I think that it is really something we need to look at. You see, 1 Corinthians, Paul was writing to a group of uh, ch Christians in the church of Corinth, and they were, shall we say, uh, having some problems both with faith and with their carrying out their faith. And so he had to correct some things. But then when he gets to the 15th chapter, he's just plain talking what we would call doctrine, the teaching of the truth of, Christ, of God's word. And he covers quite a bit about resurrection. He does end up correcting a problem about some of their actions in that chapter too. But he's talking about the importance of the resurrection. My thought on it very simply is that the resurrection is important because it was the proof that Jesus Christ really was who he said he was, that he was God in the flesh. That he, nobody but God can rise from the dead on his own. And so that proved that when he said he was the Messiah living uh, for us, that's the guarantee, in a sense, in my mind. Uh, the, the physical evidence for us. But there's all kinds of passages in the Old Testament, the prophecies about the resurrection that are, I love that. You guys know I love prophecy. I love to read where God says a thousand years before something happens, this is what I'm going to do and this is how I'm going to do it. And then we see where it actually happened. And right down to the smallest detail, uh, there, are, there are all kinds of prophecies about the crucifixion. Um, there are literally I'm not sure of the exact number. It seems to me it was 120, but I might be wrong. It's over 100 prophecies of, in the Old Testament about the Messiah, the Christ, and what, how, about his birth, about things he was going to do while he was alive, 
about his death and about his resurrection. I love that because as you look at what it tells us in the Gospels, you see every one of those coming exactly, detail by detail by detail. God knew what he was talking about. He knew what he was going to do, and he did. But that also makes me think, that was a promise to the Jewish people that he was going to send a Messiah. And he also tells them that it's a Messiah, a Savior, not just for the Jews, but for every person, for whoever will call upon his name. And for the Jewish people in the Old Testament, they had a hard time with that. Even in the, and as we look at the disciples, as Jesus was teaching them, they had a little trouble with that one because the Jewish people had always been taught that they were special. They were God's people and nobody else really counted. So that one was hard for them. God says his salvation and his love is to all people. Here in 1 Corinthians, when he's writing about the resurrection, it kind of is an, a matter of correcting a problem in the church because they had a problem with people who were teaching that if one of your loved ones has passed away and they had never received Christ as their Savior, that would mean that they were destined to hell. He says, but if you are baptized in their name, you can save them. I don't know where that doctrine came from. It sure didn't come from the Bible. <laughs> but, and so Paul had to correct that one. <laughs> but uh, there, there are all kinds of... It's amazing how man can twist things in the scriptures or add to them with all kinds of things. We were talking in Sunday school class a few minutes ago about um, what they were called, what they were, the people that were called legalists. And we still use that term today because it's still true. <laughs> it still fits. The legalists back then and now were those who would say that, um, yes, you're saved by trusting in Jesus Christ as your Savior, by asking him to be your Savior. Faith in Christ is what it takes to be saved. But then they would say, but to stay saved, you have to follow this list of rules. Yeah, uh-huh. The Bible doesn't say that. It does say we, the Lord wants us to live the way he described it, that we should live. And, and I mentioned in Sunday school that you can take those commandments that he gives throughout the scriptures and boil them down as Christ did to, his, to the crowd and to the Pharisees, and they didn't like it, um, by saying that there are two major commandments. This is the Lord thy God with all thy heart and mind and soul and body. And he says the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. He says if you, met, if you do those two, you don't have to worry about all the rest. You'll automatically be taking care of them. And when you think about it, yeah, if you love somebody, you're not going to steal from them. You're not going to lie to them. You're not going to cheat them. All those things that we know we ain't supposed to do, if you love a person, you're not going to do that. So that fulfills six of the Ten Commandments. The other four, the first four, are about our relationship with God. And if we put God first in our lives, we're not going to violate any of those other four. So, yeah, very simply, looking at the Ten Commandments makes it pretty obvious that, yeah, those two sum up all of the commandments that God gave, very simply. He didn't give a list of rules. Oh, i got to ask. I know some of you know, in the time of Christ, the Pharisees and Sadducees had put together a list of what they called the commandments to be right with God. Do you remember how many they had? Roger's thinking. He must have known it at one time. 613. You want to try to keep 613 rules? I couldn't remember 613 rules, much less keep them. You don't make it to heaven by doing a bunch of rules, by earning your way. That's not what it's all about. And that really wasn't supposed to be part of my message. <laughs> but here we are. Let's look at chapter 15 in 1 Corinthians 
Paul starts out by reminding them the very simple definition of what the gospel, the good news about Christ, is. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. It says you have to have meant it when you ask Christ to be your Savior, but if you weren't sincere, then that was a waste. But first, or verse 3, For I delivered unto you first of all that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and then he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Basically, he says, that's the gospel. Christ died for our sins, he was buried, and he rose again. But I love that he throws in there twice, according to the Scriptures. He says, this was all predicted. This is what it tells us back in the Old Testament. The prophets said was going to happen to the Messiah. He says, and it did. Verse 5, and that he was seen of Cephas, that's Peter, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of about 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, Paul speaking, as of one born out of due time. I love the way he goes down. Remember, Paul was a lawyer. He's putting his evidence in order there. He says, and all of these people saw him alive after his resurrection. And I really like where he says, after that he was seen of above 500 brethren at once. That would be pretty impressive. But then he adds, of whom the greater part remain under this present. They're still alive. So you can go ask them. <laughs> That's how to make your point, isn't it? He's telling them there isn't any question. He says, here's all these witnesses. Go talk to them. They will tell you what they saw. And he says, I did too. I met him after he had died and rose again. We're we were told about that in the book of Acts, how that after... And he goes on here to say that he's the least of all the apostles, not even worthy to be called an apostle because he had persecuted the church of Christ. Well, Paul, as Saul of Tarsus, they, well, his name before he became a Christian, he had been raised as a Pharisee, grown up in the church, uh, the Jewish Sanhedrin. He was one of the top. He was in the Sanhedrin, the, top, the 50 leaders of Israel. And he, along with the rest of the Pharisees and Sadducees, was involved in getting Christ crucified. And after that, for two years, three years, he persecuted the Christian church, getting Christians arrested and executed. So Paul says, I was, I'm the least of the apostles because I wasn't worthy even to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. And then, of course, there was that one day on the Damascus Road when God, Christ, appeared to him and turned his whole life around in an amazing way. Well, you know, when Christ comes into your life, he turns it around. He changes a lot of things. And that, that's true, always. But for Paul, that's about the most dramatic example I know of. He turned him from a man who was persecuting the church and having Christians murdered to one who was, it became probably the greatest evangelist the Christian church has ever had. One of the things that is easy to forget is that Paul, as we talk about him, it came from that kind of a background. We think of Paul as the great Christian preacher and teacher, and he wrote half of the New Testament, but he really knew what it was like to be on the other side. And he knew the difference of what Christ's death, burial, and resurrection meant to him. Just a little later in this chapter, he makes that real clear because he goes down, let's see, go to verse 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if 
Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain. And your faith is also vain. Yea, and we're found false witnesses of God. Because we have testified of a God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if it be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ risen. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. And then they also which are fallen asleep have died in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, then we of all men are most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and became the first fruits of them that slept. He says, if Christ didn't rise from the dead, man, our whole faith is useless. He says, but he did. And because he did, we have new life. I love the verse where in Galatians he says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not me, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live by the faith of Christ, I lost something. There's another phrase there that I left out. Sorry about that. <laughs> but he says it's now Christ living in me. Not, it's not my life, my old life. It's a new life in him. I love the, uh, another verse where it tells us that once we're in Christ, we are a new creation. Uh, made new. That's a great thought too. All of our sins are washed away. Let me, I'm going to ask for somebody to answer this one. Give me at least two of the examples that, that the Bible uses for how God deals with our sins when Christ forgives them. Do you remember? How does it say, how does it describe how he gets, does with our sins? Say it. Exactly. That was one of the great ones. He says that he moves them as far away as the east is from the west. How far? Well, if you start going east, you ain't never going to get west. <laughs> You're going to still be going east. Another one? Say it again. The sea of forgetfulness. He says that he takes them and casts them into the deepest sea. I love that one because you know what? All my, all my people already know this. I enjoy science. I enjoy all of those kind of things. And one of them I like is oceanography. If you were to ask an oceanographer about the deepest place in the ocean, our, uh, as far as we know right now, the deepest spot in the ocean is what they call the Marianas Trench. It is over in the Sea of Japan. And it is a little over seven miles straight down. Now, if you drop something overboard and it goes down seven miles into the water, you ain't getting it back. <laughs> it's gone. So I love that example. Do you guys remember any of the other examples? I was thinking of one more that just came to mind. Got it. It's a, God says in one verse in the Isaiah that he takes our sins and puts them behind his back. Can I see what's in my hand behind my back? It's gone. <laughs> All of those say, once we ask Jesus Christ to be our Savior and ask Him to forgive our sins, they're gone. They are no longer going to be any problem for us. Taken care of. Wiped out by Christ's death on the cross. That's the basis of all of that forgiveness. And that doesn't just apply to being at the moment you're saved. That applies to us as Christians as we continue on in our daily life. Do you remember the verse in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9? If we confess our sins, our, yeah, if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all iniquity. I like that word all in there. And to cleanse us from all iniquity, all guilt. It's gone. Forgiveness is one of the greatest blessings that God gives to us all. We are free from the guilt of our misdeeds. You ever notice how people love to use other words to describe their actions instead of saying that they were sin? I made a mistake. I slipped up. Um, I, <laughs> I failed. Or <laughs> they got a, you'll have a dozen different... Um, expressions that all boil, all boil down in the end to, yes, I sinned. 
I disobeyed God's commandments one way or the other. And that very simply, people like to argue about what is sin. I can define it for myself very simply. And that is any time I choose to do what I want to do instead of what God says I should do, that's sin. That's sin. Just there's several other vers- or there's several verses in the scriptures that describe what sin is, but that's what it boils down to. Anytime I decide to go my way instead of doing what God says I should, that's sin. Okay. So what is the resurrection's importance to us? The fact that it proves to us he really was the Messiah, God in the flesh, like he said he was. And that means that all he said about the crucifixion and its action for us, its importance for us, is absolutely true. You see, God keeps his promises. All throughout the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, he had promised there would be this Savior, this Messiah, who would come, not just for the Jews, but for the whole world, and would be the way that we could be right with God, would provide a way. And over and over again it says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Just that simple. Not believe and then do a bunch of different things works or anything like that it's funny even so-called christian churches uh, or christian churches that are just misled i guess maybe it might be a better word will add other things that they think has to be a part of salvation Um, some of them say you have to believe and be baptized Um, others will have other things they say you've got to do after you're saved, or after you've asked Christ to be your Savior. The fact is that if I have to do anything to earn my salvation, then basically I'm saying I didn't, what Christ did wasn't good enough, that I've got to add to it. And you know, you and I can't add to anything that God does. What he does is perfect. There's no adding to it. Now, yes, he does tell us to go ahead and live the way he has told us throughout the scriptures. He doesn't mean it's a license to just go and do anything we want to do. But that penalty, that eternal penalty, is taken care of at the moment we ask Christ to be our Savior. That doesn't mean that all the consequences are taken care of. You and I know that if we sin as Christians... Uh, There may be earthly, physical consequences for our sins. Um, If I were to go out and get drunk and get in a car accident and kill somebody, they're still dead. Christian or not, right? Things like that. Or one that comes to mind is a guy years ago, he had been an alcoholic, got in a bar fight, lost the sight in one eye as a consequence of that bar fight. And he kind of had the impression that once he asked Christ to be his Savior and now he was being a good Christian, he ought to get his sight back. Nothing says that. That earthly consequences you may have to deal with. Not always. God is usually, he's been very generous and he helps us through a lot of those so that we don't take all the consequences that could be there. But nevertheless, that, that's just because he's a merciful God. A very, very merciful God. To, well, to put that very gently, how merciful is God? Well, how many second chances does he give us <laughs> over and over and over again? God's mercy is as great as he is, as he immense or as, uh, maybe I should say, infinite as he is. I better be careful with that, though, because there are a few circumstances in the scriptures where it says that God, because somebody was really way out of line, did take them home early. So obviously there, it's possible to reach a point in your testimony that you've res- messed your testimony up so bad, God says, no, that's enough for now. <laughs> but I think that is extremely rare. One of the examples that comes up is in the same same book, just back a couple of chapters, verse 11, uh, chapter 11, 
Paul is dealing with the Corinthian church and he tells them that you have really totally messed up the communion service, the what we call the Last Supper or the communion. And what they had done, they had simply taken, they had combined their celebration of the communion service with what we would call a potluck. And there's nothing wrong with that. But what they were doing, the Corinthian church was, I guess I'd call it stratified. There were a lot of Jews and a lot of Gentiles, more Gentiles than Jews. There were a lot of people that were quite poor and a few that were very rich. Now God does that. He calls a few that are rich. He calls people from all walks of life, though usually the majority is from the common folks. But what had gone wrong in this situation for their potluck type of thing, the people were bringing in food to share, but those who were wealthy brought in very nice food and they sat here in this area and shared it among themselves. And those who weren't brought in whatever they had and sat over in this area and shared it among themselves. Nobody would, nothing, no communication between the two. If we're looking there at more of selfishness or something or other, certainly wasn't Christian love being shown for a potluck supper or dinner, whatever. So Paul says, look at what you're doing. Is this demonstrating the love of Christ? And he tells them, because of this, God is already uh, messed with your blessings. He says, some of you are sick because of the way you're acting. And some have already died. Because you're just being so unloving toward each other. Love is supposed to be a sign of the Christian, isn't it? Do you remember what Jesus told the disciples the rest of the world would recognize Christians by? Yeah, he says, by this shall all men know ye are my disciples, by your love for one another. Hmm. Well, Paul says, you guys really messed that one up, and God is already dealing with you. Better shape up. So sometimes God does deal with very f clear physical consequences for our sins, even for Christians. But um, ordinarily... He's so merciful that <laughs> we can't even imagine how merciful he is. I got to quit. I'm looking at the clock and I don't have any more time. In fact, I should have been done. Uh, Easter morning, the resurrection of Christ. Does it matter to us? Yes, yeah, sure does. It shows me this is the true Messiah, the Christ of God. God himself, the eternal, immortal God in human form and demonstrates that he meant what he said about salvation and that he kept his promise. He always does. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that we are able to come together and rejoice in this celebration today. I thank you for these folks that are here with us. God, thank you for bringing them in. I just pray, oh Lord God, for each one that you will bless each of us as we, as we go out of here today. Uh, you know what's going to be next coming up in our lives. And I just ask you to show us great blessings, a lot of joy. And I, I ask you for, I know there's always troubles coming somewhere along the line. So for those, I ask you for patience and strength, whatever we need. And I thank you, God, that you're always there, that you've promised that you'll never leave us, never forsake us, that you go through everything with us. Thank you, my Lord God, in Christ's name. Amen. And thank you, folks. And then we'll sing this. God sent his son. They, they called him Jesus. Jesus. He came to love. He'll forgive. He lived and died. To watch the Prove 
you so much that we were able to be together this morning. I just look to you and thank you for the blessings we have and look forward to the blessings that are going to come. Most of all, thank you, God, for your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, for his death on the cross and his resurrection from the grave. The evidence to us over and over again that you kept your promise. I pray for these folks, each one of us, as we go our way, help us to be drawn to you even more during the day. Take care of them on their way, whatever they're going to be involved in. Safety and protection and blessing. Hopefully family time and a real good time rejoicing in you. Thank you, God. In Christ's name, amen.